Autism, Transsexuality and School Bullying. Hi there, it's the wise old tranny here. I thought I'd better record in my own voice and stick up a photo just in case viewers think I'm some random keyboard warrior and not a real person. I've had some real bad experiences in the past being outed as trans. I sort of live stealth for good reason. So I've blubbed out my face for the time being. In the future that may well change, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Well, it was the age of Aquarius. The Vietnam War was slowly coming to an end. Ted Heath and Harold Wilson were duking it out. Glasgow's dustmen were in strike. And here in Scotland, we'd had the three-day week power cuts and television going off here at 10.30pm on top of all this. I had to start school. I'd never been to preschool or nursery. And I had never really mixed with other children or any large groups of total strangers for that matter. So to say it was a culture shock starting primary school would be an understatement. I was like a tiny little sort of David Attenborough or Steve Irwin <laughs> minus the personality. What were these strange creatures? What are they doing? How do I do that? Why are they doing that? What am I supposed to do? I was completely lost. I felt utterly alone. I had no idea how to communicate my discomfort, let alone what and exactly how I was feeling, other than to tell a teacher that I wanted to go home. And needless to say, that didn't happen. As time went on, and I don't mean this first day, I mean just time at primary school and school in general, it got worse and worse. One of the things to understand is that I have Asperger's and when I started primary school I could speak very fluently. I had a wide vocabulary by the time school came around and I used to read aloud to other children when we went on holiday to my parents' caravan. I believe it's known as hyperlexia. Imagine you are in primary school and the teacher asks you to name an animal beginning with L. So what would you say? Lion, leopard, lima. How about lepus urapus? <laughs> Mrs. a lagomorph. You know, I was strange. As you can imagine, it went down like a lead balloon. My writing wasn't so great. Um, I knew what I was writing, but unfortunately, no one else did. Um, if you imagine trying to read an alien language when you don't recognise the syntax, the reference, or the semantics, it's... You know, nobody could decipher what my scrolls were supposed to be, even though as far as I was concerned, I was writing in English. Another issue I had was how to actually speak to people. You know, it, it wasn't that I sounded robotic. I, I used contractions, can't, shan't, don't. But all my peers said things like canny, lonely, didn't, didn't. And they spoke much more in the vernacular than I did. The result was that I stood out and I got called a swaw, a snob, and a poof. Now, the latter term was one I hadn't encountered before. So I had to ask what that meant, which led to even more taunting and teasing because I didn't know what it was. Now, I was an only child. I didn't have brothers and sisters um, and no old siblings. So this was a word that wasn't spoken in our house. It wasn't something that I'd came across. So my descent into becoming the victim of bullying sort of officially began the first day that I entered into conversation. Prior to starting school, I had spent most of my time with uh, one or the other of my parents at their place of work. So I didn't have, there, there wasn't any daycare and I didn't attend nursery school. My mum worked in an engineering uh, works as a machinist on lathes and extruding equipment and my dad was a superintendent with the local authority maintaining and installing the street lighting and uh, road signs you know bollards traffic lights pedestrian crossings that sort of thing as a consequence of that I knew lots about both those subjects I had taken a very keen interest and was very fascinated in what both my mother and my father did at work the, the, the thing was of course when it was my mum's turn to have me at work that was fine she was in an engineering work and I would just be there watching her going about her day-to-day -day duties and I wasn't really in the way it didn't present any real problems I mean health and safety would throw a wobbly nowadays but her boss didn't have an issue with it my dad on the other hand he often had to attend jobs on the motorways 
and he did not like the idea of me standing at the side of 70 mile per hour traffic thundering past, so I wasn't allowed to go with him. And when that happened, what he would do was take me to work with him and then leave me in the care of the dustman, who he was quite friendly with. So this ended up leading to another one of my fascinations, which was dust carts and rubbish collection. Now, today it would be absolutely unheard of, but this was the early 70s. And I suppose in many third world countries, children in work environments are far more common, certainly not here in the UK, since the Acts of Parliament in 1788, 1833 and the 1933 Children and Young Persons Act, you know, it, it was pretty much unheard of. Children didn't work. Now, although I wasn't actually working or engaged in work, being in those sorts of work environments was pretty unusual, even for the early 70s. I was odd. Well, to be exact, I was different. It wasn't that I actually acted really weird so much. It was just that I was a bit more like a tiny little old person in a child's body. I just couldn't relate to the other kids and I just didn't understand why they teased me or called me names. It, yeah, it just didn't compute. I was like Mr Spock from Star Trek. You know, I found it fascinating but highly illogical behaviour. I really just didn't understand how I was upsetting these people to make them do this to me. So I did try and interact with others. Um, usually I interacted more with individuals though rather than the group. It was never smooth sailing. I had a real tendency to do what I'm doing just now, which is talking about me and my interests or basically wax lyrical about some subject matter that no one else really cared about. My interests were dinosaurs, space, history, like the Eocene, Pliocene, the Silurian period. Volcanoes, uh, how does a seagull maintain, you know, flight? How, how is it aerodynamic? You know, what is the physics? What's going on here? Why doesn't it fall back to the ground? And I just found all that sort of stuff fascinating. Schoolwork, not so much. As my time with school went on, my studies began to suffer horrendously. I mean, I found out it was impossible for me to focus on anything in a class of 32 children. I mean, I would just zone out or, well, more specifically, not so much zone out, but zone in on some subject that usually had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the subject being taught by the teacher. I was bored. Teacher would be standing by the blackboard talking to the class about arithmetic, times tables, spelling, and all I could hear was blah, 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 from the teacher. But at the same time as her language and, and, and speech became unintelligible background noise, I could hear every single word that Amanda and Vicky at the back table were saying about the virtues of Shawadi Wadi versus the Bay City Rollers, or the buzzing from the overhead fluorescent lights and the constant tick, 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 tick of the clock in the back wall of the class. Those were all the things that my brain focused in on and honed in on to the exclusion of everything else. My school report card stated that whilst I was more than capable, I took a cavalier attitude toward my work and I needed to concentrate more. I was said to live in a fantasy world and for me it was only getting worse. I felt like I existed in a bubble alone and isolated even in the midst of everyone in this class. The early teasing and the name calling had now developed to where I was ignored, unless I was to be the subject of the teasing and the bullying. I became more and more withdrawn and I internalised even more. I learned pretty quick to keep quiet and not to offer an opinion on anything, lest it result in intimidation and bullying at the break. So the taunting and intimidation eventually failed to satisfy the needs of the bullies, and they basically turned the volume up to 11, with actual violence, pushing, tripping, slapping, punching, you name it. I was on the receiving end of it. I never told us all. You know, even if I had... What would I have said? I couldn't remember people's names. Uh, I mean, that was a fact. I was utterly useless at remembering names. I remembered maybe six or seven of the names of people in my class, and that's a class of 32. In my year group, there were two classes. So I was one individual from 62 people. It took me a month to remember the name of the teacher, and, and I saw her every single day. Faces I never forget. I can remember faces vividly and the faces of the bullies 
I remember like it was yesterday, everything they ever said or did to me, that's just locked away in there. And that actually still boggles my mind to this day that, that those seemingly pointless pieces of information are locked away there in the grey matter. Another aspect to the bullying was the insistence of my peers that I was adopted and that my parents were actually my grandparents. All of this deeply, deeply affected me. My father was 60 when I was born. My mother was 40. Um, they had been married over 20 years before I was born and they were protective and they were very, very proud to have a child at that uh, time in life. Now, at that time, there was probably less than 20 cars in the whole estate where we lived, and my dad was one of those car owners. He had a new car every three years until he retired, and basically the money had run out. He had taken early retirement due to a heart condition. And then the thing with my dad was that he'd been a biker, you know, not a hell's angel, but he rode motorcycles. And he only decided to get a car because I had came along. <laughs> And ruined everything for him and my mum who used to go on this motorcycle of his. Now, because of that, he bought a Reliant Regal. And that's a three-wheeled car that was very popular in the 50s and 60s, but it was still rather unusual in the 70s and especially where we lived. If you think only fools and horses, that's a Reliant Regal van. My dad, he had the saloon version with a boot. Now, I was dropped off and collected from school from the first day I started up until around primary four. Uh, because around about this time, my dad retired and no longer really needed the car. So he'd gotten rid of the car. The other children, see, see my parents, the other children obviously insisted that they were my grandparents. Yeah, they, they taunted me about them. They taunted me about the car. They taunted me about getting picked up from school. I really thought it couldn't get any worse. Well, I was wrong. When I started to have to walk to and from school, it allowed the opportunity for the bullies to actually be physically violent. Usually this was on the way home. Occasionally it would happen on the way to school in the morning. Quite often I would arrive home covered in mud or soaking wet, and then I would get punished off my parents for being filthy and soaking. Little did they know that the reason was that I was being thrown in a barn or tripped up and thrown in mud. I knew I was different. I knew I didn't fit in. But obviously, being on the autistic spectrum, even an intelligent child like I was, I just didn't know how I really felt or why I felt different. Only that I wasn't the same. I was different. And as I approached the end of primary school and hit puberty, things really began to take a downward turn. I started to feel weird about my body and my neurological condition meant I had no idea what or why I felt this way and what was wrong. I've put a link in the description to a fantastic channel that focuses on Asperger's where autism-specific topics are discussed in detail. It, you know, this video is more about... What I had to deal with in my experiences as an autistic child at school being bullied. But that channel has a lot of fascinating information on Asperger's. Now this was the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 1980s. There was no internet. You couldn't just jump online and Google your problems. Um, I read extensively um, and I read a lot of newspapers. And as sensationalist as the tabloids tend to be, I did read some fascinating, well, at least they were fascinating to me at the time. I read about Caroline Cossey and her battles with the courts and being outed in the press. And I don't know, something sort of clicked. I mean, I still had no idea what it meant or would mean in the long term, but I was utterly clueless about the social intricacies of gender roles and expectations of gender roles. But it did lead to another of the one of the famous reasons that I was bullied. Up until around primary four, I didn't play with the other children. I mean, I never went out after school or at the weekend or anything like that. Um, the only place I went was out into my own garden. I had a lot of farm toys and action figures, the, the original palatoy action man. But the action men, I removed all the sort of military equipment and dressed them as dustmen. So there's a surprise. 
I would reenact a typical day in the life of a dustman or a typical day in the life of a farmer and that sort of thing. And I have no recollection of where I got the Barbie and Cindy dolls, but I do remember having three of those. One with a missing arm. They weren't bought for me. My, my father would never have allowed that. And my mum wouldn't have went out and bought me them. She would have dissuaded me from that sort of course. So I think I must have found them when I was out on the rounds with the real dustman, which, of course, was something that I had done since preschool. Well, now that I was older and a bit bigger, I would go out in the rounds for the whole day and haul out rubbish and throw it in the back of the truck, <laughs> as you can see. Um, my entire school holiday, Monday to Friday, 7 in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon, was spent like this. It also led to more teasing and more bullying back at school because I was dusty bin and stinky and, and all that sort of thing. But let's get back to my naivety about... Uh, gender and sex roles. I remember an incident happening when there was a, a group of us playing some sort of make-believe vampire horror scenario story where we were, you know, there were vampires and there were sort of damsels in distress. And I think there were about six boys and three girls in the group. And they varied in age, maybe a year or two older, a year or two younger, you know, as well as our own age. Now, Paul was a very effeminate boy of our age who attended a different school. And he always seemed to play the girl role along with the girls in whatever sort of role-play game was happening. On this occasion, Paul was playing the role of a damsel. And we were these male vampires. And looking back, I can see how it was all orchestrated to make a fill of me and show me in a really, really bad light and give everyone else some real mud to sling at school. If I remember correctly, this was during the summer holidays. Anyway, the guys all attacked a girl as this vampire and I was told to attack Paul, who was obviously playing the role of one of the damsels, which stupidly and not knowing any different, I did. A lot of gossip and sniggering ensued and after school resumed, I was now a confirmed pifta. The entire group that I had been cajoled into joining in with now all certified that I had gone for Paul in this pseudo-sexual way that they had gone after the girls. And of course, I was completely oblivious. I had just been playing a game. I was totally confused. Wait a minute. Paul was a girl. He was a girl in the game. Welcome to my utterly confused view of the world around me. I was acting. So was he in the context of the game. I mean, after all, I, I'm not I'm not really a vampire either, am I? Just like, he's not really a girl, and you lot told me to do it, and it made no difference. My pleas fell in deaf ears. As far as they were concerned, that was it. Now, I had a real thing for a girl in my class called Debbie, and in about 1978, Superman the movie was in cinemas. And myself, Debbie, her aunt, and my mum, talk about chaperones, went to the cinema to see it. Now, they were also re-showing Jaws, at this small local cinema called The George. And that was my first real date, I suppose, if you like. Unfortunately, Debbie and I, I don't think we ever really did hit it off properly. And we were never in each other's company without my mother and her aunt being present. And she would later move away to London. But I think this was as much my total ineptitude where women and social interaction in general was concerned and it sort of totally defeated the ends of dating. So after that, it was quite a while before I even considered dating. Now, when high school came around, I was determined that it wasn't going to uh, turn out the same way as primary had. I wasn't going to allow the experience in my past seven years dictate the next four. I wanted out of school so badly I could literally feel every second of time I had to spend there tick away tick 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 it was like the clock for primary except it was a countdown from day one at school to day zero when I could leave and I knew this was only four years so with that information I had a renewed attitude and thought this time it's going to be different boy was that wrong the way classes split up to learn the different subjects with different teachers really threw me for a You know, it, it, I was just, what? Where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? 
I was always late. I would turn up at the wrong class. I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember a single teacher's name. And there were so many people. I mean, at first I determined, right, okay, I'm going to get my academic studies on track. And I thought that science would present a perfect opportunity for me to do that. There was, however, one pivotal moment in my first year science class, in my pretty much first ever science class at high school that was to change my view of school forever. Uh, my first day in that class, and the, we'd been having a talk, the teacher was explaining things to us, and then he started to ask the class if anyone could tell him the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Now, a couple of students sort of tentatively stuck their hands up and stood up and gave their answers. You know, the answers like, um, you can pour a liquid, but you can you pour a solid as a gas and the like. So... There was different answers being given and he was like thanking them and uh, asking if anyone else, you know, wasn't quite what he was looking for. So I sort of finally said, right, I'm going for it. I'm going to answer this question and, and somebody's going to notice that I'm not stupid. <laughs> so I stuck my hand up and uh, yes, said the teacher. So I stood up and I said, molecules in a gas are well separated with no sort of solid arrangement. Whereas the molecules in a liquid are close together with no solid arrangement. And the molecules in a solid are really, really tightly packed and close together in a solid arrangement. So now his reply, sit down and don't use words you don't understand. That is wrong. Now his name was Dr. Richard Wardle and he was a doctor of science. And so from that day forward, I never really listened to another word the man said. Now, what he'd wanted to hear as he went on to proclaim to the class later was that solids are best defined as occupying a constant volume and retaining their shape when moderate forces are applied to them. Liquids also occupy a constant volume but easily change shape to match that of their container by flowing to form a horizontal surface. They're said to flow easily or be runny or wetting and they can withstand moderate compressive forces whereas a gas can occupy any size container and is able to flow and can be easily compressed with moderate force and that's good coming from a science doctor holder but instead of shutting me down and telling me to sit down and shut up in front of the entire class he could have pointed out my errors and asked me to expand on what I said and I mean indeed he could have did that for everyone but instead of molecules technically I suppose I should have said particles for example and instead of saying a solid arrangement, what I was trying to articulate or get across to him was a regular arrangement pattern. I knew exactly what I meant. I knew I was right. I knew I knew what I was talking about as well. But I just didn't put the answer across properly. But that moment destroyed everything that I had believed by this man of science. I was left questioning that one question that he had asked and my answer and running it over and over and over and over again in my head for the next hour of the class. To this day, I have no idea what the rest of the lesson was about. It was just because I was completely zoned out. I was lost in the, 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 the corridors of my own mind, fretting and, and, and just trying to work out this question and answer and how it had all went so horribly wrong. So high school in that respect turned out worse than primary. Instead of there just being the one teacher who knew my capabilities a fair bit, I had numerous teachers who didn't know me at all. Statistically speaking, I was a poor student. So as a result, I ended up in the low achiever classes for all of my subjects, which in turn made me even less likely to apply any effort or engage with anyone because I was bored beyond belief. By the end of the second year of high school, some of the old stuff from primary had begun to rear its ugly head again. Only this time there were more people, new bullies, different slurs to add into the mix. So I decided in my usual inimitable <laughs> f fashion that, that you no, know, this has to stop. And I reasoned that since no loving thing increases its chances of survival by allowing itself to be more easily victimised... Darwinian evolution produces predators and prey and I was sick of being the prey. I basically formed the opinion that I preferred women's clothes and that I had in, I enjoyed activities usually associated with women. I just, I wasn't attracted to men 
and I had a very healthy appreciation of women. At least I thought that that is exactly what it was. So there was one girl in particular in my class. I, be, please bear with me. I, I seem to have gone off on a tangent, but I haven't really. <laughs> There was a girl in particular in my class called Helen and she always wore makeup, her hair was always immaculate, well styled, she wore shoes and clothes that you would normally attribute to older girls or, or women and I sort of idolised her. I felt very attracted to her but being a slim, blonde, spectacle wearing geek thought that she was way out of my league. So result being my infatuation went no further. Now for her part, Helen had something of a snobby ear she was quite unapproachable as a person not only towards me but to many others as well so at this point I had decided I don't want to be bullied but I'm not like these guys in my class so I was identifying more with the girls behavior and stuff but at the same time I wasn't attracted to men so I knew I wasn't gay I just couldn't quite put my finger on what it was I also knew that I didn't want to be six foot two and built like the Incredible Hulk. But I had to do something to stop this bullying. And I had basically sort of drawn the line in the sand and decided this far, no further, it stops. Now, my father had tried to teach me boxing. He had been a boxer and a wrestler, amongst other things. But it was something I never really took to. But my desire to be left alone and to stop being hurt led me to join martial arts classes away outside of my local area. So in my local area, I used to sit in on karate classes that one of my friends attended. By this point in high school, I actually had a small circle of friends. And although there weren't many of them, they, they were sort of my, my close inner circle. And I didn't want them to know. <clears throat> because I didn't want just the teasing that would come from such knowledge. So in my sneaky away missions, I would attend classes uh, given alias names and using the addresses of empty or dilapidated properties that were listed for demolition. So I went to Taekwondo, Kung Fu, Judo, I had a plug at all of them. Um, often I would come sort of unstuck at a club if they had posted stuff out to me and my sneaky mail redirect hadn't worked or... If I was found out, for example, like if a letter arrived at my mum's house with a different name on it and my mum would maybe bin it or return it to the postman and I would be caught out when they said, did you get your licence through or did you get your application or did you get this thing that your parents need to sign? So if that happened, I would simply never go back, join another club, use a different name again and so on and so forth. I was picking up a lot of skills and techniques and I was beginning to feel a little bit more confident. Now, at one point, a boy from the year above me, which would have been 30 at that point, uh, decided to start with me this, this day at lunchtime. And he started the usual taunts, you know, specky, skinny, then dug up a slagging from primary school, which is vernacular for a derogatory nickname, and called me handbag, which had been one of the... The, the nicknames at school, at primary. So for the first time in my recollection, I wasn't actually upset, hurt or felt like crying, but I was <laughs> actually angry. In the past, it was usually the latter. I'd, I'd usually been, um, I would usually just burst into tears or run away or, or just get upset, noticeably so. Um, even though there was an occasion in primary where I'd been sent home for punching and bursting a boy's nose. But aside from that, in the main, I had um, I had never ever hit back or retaliated any of these times. I just I was just a punching bag. So on this occasion at high school, this taunting ex escalated. He started pushing me, slapping me, and then started the "Come on, fight me, put your poof," and started calling me the poof again. So I'd had enough. Um, as we entered the, the foyer of the school, I demanded that he go outside and we have a one-on-one -on -one square go and sort this out. And of course, I'd orchestrated it so that as soon as he walked outside, I could pull the fire door style door with the bar on it shut behind him and effectively lock him out in the playground. <laughs> the crowd that was stood around um, actually found this utterly 
hilarious. I mean, they were laughing at his predicament and that just infuriated him even more. Then, of course, one smart aleck opened the door and he comes charging in, ready to unleash his frustration and humiliation in me. So he charges at me across this sort of shiny, polished foyer floor. And I remember vividly that for the first time, I didn't run. I didn't cry. I wasn't shaking or trembling. I just stood my ground. So as he flew towards me, I basically just used his own weight and momentum and a nifty little judo throw I'd learned, and I just threw him with a hip throw right onto his back, with me astride him, pinning his arms, and seven years of resentment of bullies poured right out of my fists and straight into his face. Now this went on for maybe 30 seconds, and then I stopped. I was summoned to the deputy headmaster's office and had been grabbed off this boy and frog marched there by one Dr. Richard Wardle, the uh, science teacher from from earlier. So as Dr. Wardle let loose on me about my nasty bullying behaviour and how I had hurt this boy and how he was bleeding and how terribly inappropriate my behaviour was, I let loose in return. I, I think I had just been pushed over the edge, beyond the point of no return. I've no idea where it came from, but it just out it came. I said, I am sick and tired of being bullied. I've had it all through primary, and now it's trying to start here again, and it's not going to happen. I'm not wearing it. He attacked me, he bullied me, he was taunting me, and he had been calling me a homosexual. Now, since the two of us were sat in the same room... While this exchange took place, Dr. Wardle simply turned and asked him about it. To which he replied, I was only joking, I was only messing around, uh, it was a just, it, it was in fun, it was not a hard slap when I, I pushed him. And he also said, he didn't call me a homosexual, I don't even know what that is. At that point, Dr. Wardle explained, and I piped up to say that the word he used was poof. And Dr. Wardle explained that that was in effect the same thing and how inappropriate it was, etc. and so on. At this point, he burst into tears. I get suspended for a day. And when I returned, I had to come accompanied by both my parents for this um, interview with a guidance counsellor. And for me, that was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as school was concerned. That, that was it. I'd had enough. No more. Uh, I just didn't want to be there. My primary school attendance had been horrific, to put it mildly. I was absent with colds, tonsillitis, stomach pains, diarrhea and vomiting, and etc, etc, etc. I would sometimes be off school for three weeks at a time. I'd never really tuned it at primary, but now we were getting into the third year of high school, and basically I was seldom there. I would attend registration and then I would bunk off and then on other days I simply didn't attend at all. I spent my days either with a dustman or if I'd found something new and interesting by way of female clothing or shoes then I would disappear away into the woods or isolated areas and basically try them on. I had began to collect clothes and shoes and such from the rubbish that I was collecting if they were placed separately and they had been washed or they were clean and fresh. I only ever sort of collected outerwear and, and shoes and things like that. Never underwear, anything like that. It was just the outerwear. And I had found that dressing in them had brought an immense feeling of calm and relaxation to me. School, interacting with others... The day-to-day -day stress and being hyper-vigilant and all the heightened anxiety that that brought with it took everything out of me. It, it really drained me. And this wearing of these clothes were my sort of whale song, my, my calming sea sounds, the melody to my soul. One of the classes that I enjoyed in year two had been classical studies. And it wasn't an option for me in year three. Another class that I did find quite interesting was social studies um, or basically sex education with some extra sort of stuff thrown in. My social studies teacher was Mr Hunter who was a large no-nonsense guy with a, was a Tom Selleck moustache and it was basically in his class that a lot of the stuff that had been smashing around inside my head like so many dodgem cars began to make sense. I mean, my father was now in his 70s 
and my mum in her 50s. So these weren't the sort of people I thought of having a conversation about sex with. And in Mr Hunter's class, I learned of the sort of societal gender norms and the, the concepts of homosexual attraction and basically the basic sex education. Right there and then in his class, those memories of Paul and that vampire game gave me shivers. I, I sort of, it re- made me realise what the boys were inferring and insinuating and I knew for sure that that's not me. I knew by this point I wasn't gay, I wasn't, I didn't find men attractive. I will go into my sexual preferences in another video, but for now we'll concentrate on the bullying and school aspect. Mr Hunter introduced us to the book Conundrum by Jan Morris. Now, this information about Jan Morris and this book were to me pivotal moment in my life and my development. Jan Morris was a transsexual woman, a journalist, and had been a member of the 1953 Mount Everest expedition with Sir Edmund Hillary when Everest was was conquered and I was engrossed. I'd finally found a name for basically what I thought I was. At least I had sort of partly identified. Recognising an autism was, was still some 30 plus years away but by this point I had recognised something in me that I could identify with. Fourth year at high school pretty much went like third. Um, I had been forced by the guidance staff to choose O grades of GCSE subjects that I didn't really want to take. I had opted to take only the most basic classes that resulted in no real sort of academic qualifications but they were having none of it. Apparently the quality of my (laughs) piss poor work that I actually did complete was sufficient that they weren't prepared to let me sit in classes aimed at those with learning difficulties despite my best efforts to land myself in those classes because they wouldn't require any effort or work. Now one such class was chemistry O grade or GCSE. I had been stuck with this teacher called Mr Barber and he disliked me and... I despised him. And here I was, stuck with this guy for two years. I mean, I vividly recall a time when I was sat in his class and he was talking about calorific values of substances, how to calculate energy, etc., and how energy was stored. Of course, I was paying no attention. I had been moved to a table right at the front of the class where he could more readily see I was doing nothing and keep an eye on me. And in this day, I was drawing dust caps or bin lorries on my notebook. And all of a sudden, he reaches over, grabs the fringe of my hair with a pair of scissors in his hand and cuts a big chunk right out of the front of it. And I mean, so right in the centre of my fringe. And it was cut at an angle. It was horrid. He then proceeds to demonstrate burning the hair to show its stored energy. And meanwhile, my fringe was destroyed. Now, during my primary years, I had grown my hair. Um, I had a sort of mushroom. The problem was I used to have a meltdown at the mere suggestion of the barbers. So my father used to <laughs> literally pin me down and cut my hair. And it pretty much always resulted in the bowl cut style. Now, the thing was, I didn't really mind this. Um you know, long hair. Long hair was a thing for boys in the 70s and I got away with it. But by the time we've sort of gotten into high school, that sort of trend had sort of died a death and a lot of the boys were sporting sort of spiked hair and flat tops and um, even having their hair permed and coloured and things like that. All of which I thought, yeah, great, I'm up for that but the problem was if I had done any of those things I just thought I would have been opened up to more bullying, ridicule and taunting so I may do my sort of mushroomy bob type um, blonde <laughs> locks that, that came naturally um, I was no longer having haircuts from my dad right enough and I had been left to do, devise my own hairstyles there was no more Sweeney Todd haircuts and I'd grown it quite long. 
So this assault on my fringe left me so traumatised and hurt that I ended up going to the barbers on the Saturday and I had a number two all over, a buzz cut. And I, I stuck with that buzz cut throughout the latter half of third year and, and the fourth year before it had actually grown sort of out into a sort of mushroom style again. I'd also started to sort of wear more, kind of more of an individual style of clothing rather than the school uniform. Uh, very glossy black patent sort of winkle picker shoes and tight trousers and I also sort of rocked up in a donkey jacket complete with the orange um, shoulders. A donkey jacket is a sort of woolen sort of reefer style coat that was very popular by workmen in the 70s. I was quite often dropped off at school by the dustman at this time because by now at the, the age of 15 and 16 they were paying me to help as a sixth crew member on the rounds and then I would return to school after they dropped me off at school at sort of 9 a.m. and uh, then possibly slope off afterwards and disappear somewhere. Other than that, I didn't really attend much in third or fourth year. The second half of third year, I truanted most of it and pretty much the same with fourth. I returned to school on the days of the exams and I sat all of my prelims and I remember only sitting maybe four of my O grades or GCSEs. When I did my final exams, I found myself hauled up uh, before the principal again because I was accused of cheating. I had scored one of the highest biology exam grades in school and they were convinced that I must have cheated. Uh, now, biology was one of those subjects that I really did enjoy, despite my... I despised writing and I despised homework, so that was always terrible. But I found the curriculum of O-level biology particularly simplistic in its scope. Um, as, as, you know, so, despite my crap classwork, the actual exam was simple. I explained this and... Uh, Eventually, after a while, they sort of accepted my explanation after they had looked at my similarly high prelim results in biology, which were comparable but not quite as high. So they then went on to try and suggest that I stay on at school. And I was thinking to myself, are you joking? I despise this place. It's been like a prison. I have served four years in this place and I cannot wait to get my leaver certificate. The effects of bullying are not just short term, they, they affect a long term. It has effects that are still quantifiable and noticeable well into middle age. Studies have shown that bullies themselves tend to be strong, more popular, they have good social understanding, they're quite often bi strategic, and that they'll employ both bullying and aggressive sort of prosocial behaviour by acting out publicly, therefore making the victim dependent because they can't reciprocate. One in three children report having been bullied at some point in their lives, and between 10 and 14% report chronic bullying that lasts longer than six months. Now, bullying occurs in settings where individuals don't have any say concerning the group they want to be in. It can be like school or home, and this is being compared to being caged with others in an effort to establish a so-called, a so-called, a social network or hierarchy. And the bullies will attempt to sort of exert their influence over all the children in that group. Now, those who have a negative emotional reaction, like crying and running away, or who just get upset, or who have no one or, or very few people who will actually stand up for them, they will become the repeated targets of the bullies. The bullies may even get others to join in, to laugh, tease, hit, spread rumours, either as bystanders or as actual henchmen, where they'll become known as bully victims because they themselves are being bullied into performing these acts and are therefore a victim, but they are also perpetrating these acts on another and thus 
they are also a bully. So, so they are classed as bully victims. Now, it's been shown that conditions that foster greater density and hierarchies in classrooms, at home, or even in, in, in nations, increase bullying and the stability of bullying victimisation over time. The studies show that the effects of being a victim of bullying can have impact on health, on self-harm, suicide, on schooling, employment, social relationships. It is really, really far-reaching the effects of, of bullying. Now, the children who are victims of bullies are much more likely to be at risk of internalising problems and to develop anxiety and depression disorders in later life. They're also more likely to have poorer general health and suffer more body pain, headaches and be slow to recover from illness when they do get ill. Being bullied can also alter your actual physiological responses to stress with obvious negative results. And in the UK, approximately 16,000 young people between the ages of 11 and 15 are estimated to be absent from state school with bullying as the main reason. And 78,000 are absent, where bullying is given as one of the reasons. And the failure to complete high school or gain academic qualifications because of bullying increases the risk of poorer income and job performance. So it has socioeconomic impact as well as health impact. Now, a lot of bullied children will suffer in silence like me. They are reluctant to tell teachers or the parents about their experiences for fear of reprisals or because of a sense of shame at being bullied. Up to 50% of children say they would rarely or never tell their parents, whilst between 35 and 60% would never tell their teacher. Now, considering the ill effects bullying has and the fact that by 18, children will have spent much, much more time with their peers than with their actual parents, it's surprising that childhood bullying isn't at the forefront as a major public health concern. Health professionals rarely ever ask children about peer relationships. Perhaps it's because they're poorly educated about bullying and they find it difficult to raise the subject or deal with it. But in conclusion, I believe it's vital that health professionals address bullying considering so many children abstain from school because of it and because of its associated health problems. Bullying certainly casts a long shadow over someone's life. And to prevent violence against the self, such as self-harm, and to reduce mental and somatic health problems, I would suggest that this is imperative. Thank you very much for watching and bearing with me to the end. I would really appreciate it if you would give this video a little thumbs up and hit that notification bell and subscribe to my channel. In my next video, I will be talking about autism, transsexuality and the criminal justice system. Until next time, bye-bye.